Good evening. I'd like to thank you all for coming. And before I do anything else, I'd like to model good behavior and take out my cell phone and turn it off. I'm Kirk Freudenberg, Chair of the Department of Classics here at Yale. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening to the eighth annual Michael Ivanovich Rostovsev Lecture. As I'm sure that all of you know, Michael Rostovsev was a giant in the study of the ancient world who taught as a Yale Sterling professor in ancient history and classical archaeology from 1925 until his retirement in 1944. This event comes to you by way of the generous support of the Sophie M. Rostovsev bequest. Upon her passing, Sophie Rostovsev left the department a generous sum of money that was to be used, in the words of the indenture, with the best judgment of the Department of Classics for the promotion of research in archaeology and history. And thus was born not just this annual lecture, but a whole set of further projects and activities in support of the study of the ancient world at Yale University. The Rostovsev Fund supports many good causes, both social and scholarly, and these include annual fellowships for graduate students to travel to archaeological sites. Tonight's lecture is the first and main event in a two-day Rostovsev Fest. I want to alert you to what else you have to look forward to. Immediately following the lecture this evening, there will be a lavish reception at the Roya Restaurant and Cafe. Roya is located just around the corner at 261 College Street on the first floor of the old Taft Hotel. I invite everyone here to please join us for hors d'oeuvres and drinks and lively conversation after the talk. Uh, and if you don't know how to get to Roya, no worries. Just join up with whatever group is heading over that way after the lecture, and you'll be there in about four to five minutes. Then tomorrow at 9 AM in room 401 of Phelps Hall, that's Michael Rostovsev's old office, there will be a follow-up symposium structured around responses to tonight's lecture. Those leading the discussion, besides Professor Bresson himself, will be Brian Muse of the University of Chicago, Dorothy Thompson, herself a former Rostovsev lecturer, welcome back Dorothy, uh, from the University of Cambridge, and Graham Oliver from Brown University. Uh, and there's sure to be lots of uh, local participation from students and scholars here at Yale as well. So again, you're cordially invited to attend 9 a.m. on the fourth floor of Phelps Hall and as always, there will be abundant coffee and refreshments. Now for just a couple of words of thanks before I turn this over to my colleague, Noel Lenski. First, thanks to all of you for coming out this evening, uh, to students especially, both undergraduate and graduate. And yes, we do notice when you come to these things. I saw Daphne, where are you? Okay, good. We're watching, but in a good way. To our stalwart friends of the classics here at Yale, and there are so many of you here that I dare not try to name you all. Also, to Linda Dickey Saucier and Tracy Finer, our administrative assistants in the Department of Classics who are behind the planning of all the evening's events, uh, down to the smallest details, and to Professor Joe Manning. All that I have just described to you is happening this evening and tomorrow because Joe Manning has spent countless hours of hard work uh, spread out over many months to make it happen. He's done this many years now, and he does it cheerfully and always with an eye towards making this the premier ancient history event in the country. Brilliantly done, as always, Joe. Uh, we are all the beneficiaries of your hard work. Uh, and now I cede the stage to Professor Noel Lenski of the Department of History and Classics here at Yale, and Noel will give the formal introduction to tonight's speaker. Thank you, Kirk, and thank you once again to all of you for showing up this evening, um, whether you're students or faculty or distinguished guests. I'd especially, though, like to extend a word of thanks to our distinguished guests, um, to our speaker this evening, Alain Bresson, and to the remaining members of the panel who will be speaking to us tomorrow morning. Uh, and I hope you can all uh, perhaps 
block out some time in order to attend at least part of that event um, where we'll have further discussion about the paper this evening. Um, those speakers will be um, Dorothy Thompson, Brian Muse, and Graham Oliver, all of whom are in the audience this evening. I too would like to thank Joe Manning for his amazing work putting this together and also Kirk Freudenberg for the work that he does as chair to keep everything running smoothly in the departments. But now to the matter at hand, and that is introducing our speaker, Alain Bresson, who is the Robert O. Anderson Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago, a title he has held since 2014. He has been professor at the University of Chicago since 2008, where he served as chair in the years between 2011 and 2014. Prior to moving to the United States, Bresson was on the faculty of the University of Bordeaux for nearly three decades. Bresson studied at the University of Lyon and took his doctorate at the University of Franche-Comté Besançon. He also obtained a degree in social mathematics and applied computing from the University of Bordeaux. He has an impressively long list of accomplishments, including invited lectures all over the globe, from Los Angeles to Moscow, including several past visits to Yale as well. He's also managed field projects in the Aegean, particularly in Asia Minor. Bresson is at once an historian, an epigrapher, a numismatist, and an economist. His earliest work focused on Greek textual sources, from which he moved into epigraphy, and following this, the economy, with a healthy amount of anthropology thrown in for good measure. Nor has he abandoned former research fields as he passed from one to the next, like some sort of slash and burn agriculturalist. On the contrary, he continues an active research program in all of the many territories he has cultivated. His lengthy CV reveals that he's edited or co-edited some six books. He has published or has in press nearly 100 articles, many of them groundbreaking studies. And here I call attention to, exa uh, for example, to a 2006 article on Marché et Prisa de Los, um, in which he showed an amazing command of epigraphic and other forms of evidence that allowed him to prove that prices for oil and grain rose in response to intense local demand when this exceeded available supply in the regional market, but that stagnant or declining prices tended to reflect patterns in the broader international market. Bresson has also published no less than five monographs. The first of these, Mite et Contradiction, was an analysis of Pindar's Seventh Olympiac. He then published Requis des inscriptions de la Paix Hérodienne, which offers a catalog of over 200 inscriptions with commentary from the Mediterranean, this Mediterranean island. With La, Marche, la Cité Marchande, published in 2000, Bresson moved squarely and decisively into the field of economic history. This book, as the title indicates, represents a shot across the bow of Moses Finley's notion of the consumer city. Finley is, of course, a towering figure in the history of the ancient economy who propounded a theory of economic primitivism, a lack of economic rationalism, limited market regulation by the state, cities interested in production, not consumption, non-existent commercial banking, thus lending only for consumption, not for investment, and ultimately little, if any, real economic growth. Bresson's book questions all of these notions using a series of case studies that provide solid evidence for market regulation by cities, an interest in promoting and regulating long distance and local trade on the part of cities, and some measure of economic rationalism on the part of individuals and even the state. The problem, as Bresson sees it, is that for all that the Greeks had a very solid understanding of rational economic behavior at the level of the household, they never developed a firm sense of macroeconomics, but simply cross-applied their notions of household management to the polis and interstate level. Bresson's masterwork is surely his L'Economie de la Grèce des Cités, published in two volumes in 2007 and 2008, which survey the Greek economic history from the 6th to the 1st centuries BCE. So clearly a monumental undertaking. 
This book has recently been translated and updated in an edition that's just out from Princeton University Press, and I present the copy that um, Colin um, will be sad to, to learn I have um, absconded with from the classics non-circulating library, but I promise I'll get it back even this evening, just so that you can see what a beautiful volume it is and perhaps put it on your Christmas wish list. The book steers something of a middle course in the modernist primitivist debate, pointing out both of the severe limitations, uh, environmental, technological, etc., on economic growth in the Greek homeland and the amazingly robust performance of the Greek economy in the classical period. During the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, Bresson argues, the Greek economy witnessed growth on the order of 0.4% annually, putting it not far out of line with the growth rate of early modern economies in Northern Europe. Bresson is able to make this and many other convincing claims in compendious fashion with some 600 pages of detailed arguments covering all aspects of the Greek economy from the environment and landscape to the money supply and inflation to the credit markets and trade regulation. Alone as a survey of the empirical data for this massive question, the book represents a colossal achievement. But it's so much more than a mere survey. It truly is the gold standard of economic history of the ancient Greek world. It lays out the data and sets out the arguments that will govern what we think about this crucial question for at least the next generation. And that's because in the ongoing struggle in the academy between the philosophe and the erudite, Bresson manages to be both. While always remaining grounded in the evidence at our disposal, he understands the larger implications and theoretical underpinnings of the larger argument and is thereby able to work the data to achieve spectacular results. Tonight, Bresson will speak to us on a question that is related to the economy and might even be of direct relevance to modern economic and social problems being faced by what were the former Greek and Roman empires. How could that be, you may ask yourselves. Well, if you read the New York Times this morning, the editorial section included an editorial by Beppe Severgini from the Corriere della Sera, who says that resettling immigrants to Italy should be done using the ancient Roman techniques of resettling veterans on centuriated land. He writes an entire article about this. This is actually directly relevant to what we're going to hear from Bresson when he speaks to us in a moment on In the Land of the Clerux, Soldiers and Their Lots from Athens to Alexandria. I, for one, would not be surprised at all if Bresson was, uh, had enough foresight to have foreseen not just that article, but the methods for resettling soldiers on land in such a way um, that he's going to solve all the problems that Western Europe, and particularly Italy, are now facing with a massive wave of new immigrants. But we'll soon find out. Let's invite uh, Professor Bresson to the stage with a round of applause. To start with, thank you, Noel, for this so nice introduction. I hope you won't be disappointed now. <laughs> but I would have to say, well, uh, it's a great uh, privilege to deliver this prestigious lecture before this distinguished uh, audience tonight, and I deeply appreciate this honor. First, I'd like to, to thank the Department of Classics at Yale University for this invitation. But beyond institutions, there are men and women. And uh, that's first of all, uh, of course, Sofia Rostovtsev, uh, whose bequest is at the origin of this lecture. Please allow me also to thank personally Kirk Freudenberg, the chair of the Department of Classics, who will have the pleasure to meet again here at Yale. Let me also thank my friends, Noel Lansky and Joe Manning. I suspect that it is their interest in economic history that justify this invitation uh, of, of today. Um, and thank you for thinking of adding my name to the list of the distinguished scholars who have delivered uh, this lecture in the previous years. Finally, let me also extend my special and warm thanks to the friends and colleagues who have accepted to join us for today and tomorrow's discussion. 
Mikhail Ivanovich Rastovtsev, or Michael Rastovtsev, as we say, was the perfect classical scholar. In one single person were united the talents of a most distinguished specialist of ancient Greek and Latin literature, epigraphy, papyrology. He was also committed to archaeologists and excavations director, illustrated by his famous work at Thura Europos. But he took also a deep interest in social and economic history, as proved of his two volumes, The Social and Economic History of the Roman Empire and A Social and Economic History of the Hellenistic World. What remains decisive in his work is the deliberate will to produce not only an economic history of the ancient world, but also to base it on textual and archetypal evidence. This remains the deep originality of his work, but as you will soon discover, we will meet again Rostovtsev in our journey in clerical land. Now, let me justify the choice of today's lecture. I'm not fully sure that this young man really was a cleric. That is to say, a man in possession of a clerus, a landlord. This full-length portrait was painted on a stele from the necropolis of Sidon in today's Lebanon. A series of similar painting steles can be seen at the Istanbul Archical Museum. Rather than a cleric, he might well have been a mercenary in the service of a Hellenistic king. Nicholas II believed that the Sidon steles would, should be dated to the mid-2nd century BCE and that they, they portray Ptolemaic rather than Seleucid soldiers. In any case, this is most probably the steel, the stele of a mercenary soldier than that of a cleric. However, we should say immediately that when they were mobilized to go to war, the weapons of the clerics, in all likelihood, must have been very similar to uh, those of the mercenaries. So whatever the weapons of the clerics uh, were, this won't be our topic of tonight, but rather their properties, their rights, and their duties. At the starting point, I should perhaps explain the reasons of this inquiry and what motivated it. I met the clerics while analyzing the question of property rights in the ancient Greek world. Indeed, it's a ba basic premise of new institutional economics that well-defined property rights are a precondition for economic growth. Economic growth there was in the ancient world, the famous graphs of Anthony Parker of the number of shipwrecks in the Mediterranean area help us to visualize this growth. Also, uh, recent, more recent uh, re-elaboration by Andy Wilson. But what were the legal conditions of this growth? In Douglas North's view, the establishment of actual pro private property right was one of the major and original factors that explained growth in England and more generally in Western Europe in the medieval and early modern period. My interrogation was just to examine what was the situation that prevailed in ancient Greece. Was it in a society where property rights were perfectly established? And if this was the case, can we say that these property rights also proved to be a major factor for growth? For Armin Alkian, who with Harold Demsitz is the author of the first understanding analysis on the topic, the definition of property rights is threefold. The exclusive authority to determine how a resource is used, for instance, the right to till or the land or leave it fallow. The exclusive right to the services of the resource, for instance, the right to benefit from the crop of, of a landlord. And the right to delegate, rent, and or sell any portion of the rights by exchange or gift, which includes also the right to transfer it to the person of one's choice to a son or daughter, etc. I would like to stress the role of exclusivity in Alkian's definition, a notion to which we'll have to come back. The establishment of property rights supposes also inevitably, in one form or the other, the existence of a state. Following Hannah Arendt, we all know that too well that human rights without a state to enforce them are pure fiction, even though the state itself can sometimes become a threat to human rights. On this point, with his Russian experience, Rostovtsev would certainly have agreed with Arendt and her German experience. Indeed, if we talk of property rights, we must also talk of the role of the state. Let us consider one moment what the European Convention of Human Rights says of property rights. 
uh, it first proclaims the universal and natural character of property rights. Every natural legal person is entitled to peaceful enjoyment of his possession. No one shall be deprived of his possessions. But immediately, as if by necessity, it formulates possible limitations. No one shall be deprived of his possession except in the public interest and subject to the conditions provided for by law. And the second item adds, the preceding provisions shall not, however, in any way impair the right of a state to enforce such laws as is deemed necessary to control the use of property in accordance with the general interest. But as you remember, the exclusive use of property was the first condition in Alkian's definition. I would like to start a casuistic debate on the question. What we mean clear in the European Convention is that the principle of private property comes first. Uh, property rights in uh, ancient Greece uh, seem to meet perfectly the three definitions of Alkian. The exclusive authority to determine how to, uh, resources used. Well, any Athenian, for instance, could decide to till his land or leave it fallow, as I said. Exclusive right to the service of the resource. And indeed, the Athenian could perfectly do what he wanted with his crop, to sell it, to eat the crop, or whatever. Uh, Third point, the right to delegate rent or sell any portion of the rights. Indeed, the same Athenian could, for instance, lease, it's very important, lease, sell, or give his property to anyone he wished, as well as transfer it to his sons or any close members, uh, family members. The only specific legal obligations, for indeed we must observe that there was one, was that he was not allowed to sell his landed property to a foreigner, for only the citizens could have access to landed property. Characteristics of private property in classical Hellenistic Greece, in Athens, and other similar cities, uh, seem to be almost identical to ours. We are in a world of exclusive rights, despite the inevitable servitudes and caveats I've talked about. This is very close to Aristotle's definition in the rhetoric 157. Ownership may be defined as the right of alienation or not, by which I mean giving the property away or selling it. But were the ancient Greek cities or kingdoms a world where property rights can be defined only in terms of exclusive rights? I think that the answer should be no, and this is, brings us to the question of the clerics. My inquiry has consisted in examining whether, as compared to those of the citizens in the framework of the city, the possibly limited property rights of the clerics were a disincentive for growth or not. Interestingly, Demsitz has investigated the notion of property rights in terms of externalities. An externality can be defined as the unintended consequence on any parties of the use of a property. Externalities can be negative, the best example being that of pollution, where the negative effects of the, the activity of an enterprise impact the general public or positive, like with the creation of a network based on the individual use of cell phones. In the case of clerarchy, where the externalities that might have negatively impacted the activity of the clerics, and thus, in the end, negatively impacted growth. But first, what was at stake with the notion of clerarchy? And why was there a specific definition of clerarchic property in the ancient Greek world? Most of the time, the investigation of clerics and clerical property has been examined in, in a specific context, which is perfectly legitimate, the Athenian Empire or the Ptolemaic Kingdom. What I would like to stress today is that we need a more comprehensive definition of clerarchy that justifies the existence of a common legal framework, both for cities and kingdoms. We need a basic definition to start from. Let's come back to our previous discussion on property rights. We have seen that the state is an essential factor for existence of property rights, for only the state is able to enforce them. The existence of the status of cleric or similar statuses in cultures other than the Greek culture is a consequence of a situation where the state not only performs its role of state, but is also the owner of the land. Insofar as the land is of no value unless it is tilled by someone, it is necessary to define a special status for the tenant of this land. This is what the Greeks named klerukos, cleric, the one who holds the klerus, the landlord. 
a cleric received the land to till and to exploit, and in Palo, he had to perform a certain number of tasks and was submitted to a certain number of taxes and other constraints. The state owning the land could be a city or a king. As we will see, although, of course, every time with, so to speak, specific contracts, the same definition applies to city and kingdom, both in the classical and in the Hellenistic period. It's what I'd like to demonstrate, at least. It's now time to move from general definition to the real world. Real world will be Athens. For the clerics of city-states, those of Athens are the best known. We shall start our journey uh, with Salamis, because in all likelihood, Salamis, the island of Salamis, was the oldest Athenian clerics, and perhaps also because it provides us crucial information on the status of the Athenian clerics. Why did it seem necessary to settle clerics, that's to say military colonists, in Salamis? The island was very close to Attica and its annexation into Athenian territory might seem to be perfectly logic. Yet, this was never the case even in the late Hellenistic period or Roman period. Why was it so? In a more distant part, past, the territory of Marathon and the Tetrapolis to the northeast of Attica had been incorporated into Attic territory. This had been the case even more recently in the history of the territory of Eleusis, um, so close to uh, Salamis, and also conquered from the Megarians, the city, city to the west, Megara. It's possible that the insularity added some foreign character to Salamis, which made it, of it a territory that was desirable to annex but not to incorporate into the Athenian territory. Margarita Giuffrida has insisted on the fact that for the Athenians, Salamis was a territory beyond the sea, just like many cities located on islands at the Peraia, a continental territory beyond the sea. However, the specific difference seems to be that not only Salamis was conquered by the Athenians, but that the Athenian settlers replaced the previous landholders. This is what I will try to demonstrate right now. What led to this situation? And who were these landholders, previous landholders? Since at least the seventh century BCE, Salamis was a contested territory between Megara and Athens. Plutarch, in his life of Solon, tells the famous story of the despair of the Athenians after the defeats they had suffered from the Megarians in their wars over the control of Salamis. So much so that in Athens, under pain of death, it was forbidden to any Athenian to mention again the case of Salamis, it was so painful, and of a possible new war against the Megarians. But pretending to be a fool, Solon managed to rally his fellow citizens to opening a new war. In this new war, and under the leadership of Solon, the Athenians prevailed. If we accept Plutarch's story at face value, this victorious war would have been fought at the end of the seventh century, or rather perhaps in the early decades of the sixth century BCE. Uh, you have the text in uh, your handout, number two. Maybe it's also for, for you to, to, to read later, but, uh, well, if you, if you like, you can, can have a look to the handouts. I will mention uh, the, the texts that are in the, in the handouts every time. Uh, as for the way Solon managed to conquer Salamis, Plutarch's narrative has many colorful details and provides several versions of the conquest. But the way Plutarch, in paragraph, paragraph 9 of uh, The Life of Solon, refers to the Megarian is interesting. Tus en Salamini Megarais. The Megarians in Salamis. This designation echoes the formula by which the Athenian clerics in Salamis later defined themselves at Tenayono Demos or in Salamini, the Athenian people in Salamis. Is it a retrospective illusion that leads Plutarch to imagine a contingent of Megarian settlers in Salamis similar to the later contingent of Athenian settlers in the island? One might be tempted to think so if another sources, Pausanias, did not refer also to a contingent of Megarians in Salamis. Pausanias, this is your handout number three, might even directly allude to Megarian clerics in the island. But the Megarians say, I quote, but the Megarians said that exiles from themselves, who they call Doricleans, reached the clerics in Salamis, clericus, uh, Produnai Salamina, and betrayed the island to the Athenians. I don't see how these clerics couldn't be uh, nothing else than 
Mikiarian clerics. Again, if we take this at face value, the text brings forward one crucial piece of information. If we have to trust Pausanias, this is in terms of chronology of very first reference to clerics in any city or kingdom. This fits well also with the image provided by Plutarch of the Megarian occupation by military settlers. It could also well explain the following decree of the city, the promise that Solon could make to the volunteers who followed him in the conquest of the island. It's Solon, paragraph nine again. Then it took 500 Athenian volunteers, a decree having been made that these should be in possession of the settlement if they took it. It is clear that the formula, curious ani to polytomatos, would fit perfectly well with a body of clerics who would settle in Salamis, Athenian this time, and who from then on would become the ruling power in the island. In that case, we have every reason to believe that the lands given to, to these Athenian clerics would those be previously occupied by the Megarian settlers. The definition of clerics might be an anachronism, but the installation of Athenian military settlers in replacement of Megarian ones could make perfect sense. The Athenian clerics would thus date back to the end of the seventh or beginning of sixth century BCE. Thus, both Plutarch and Solon refer to, and uh, Pausanias refer to Megarians in Salamis only, and we have no trace of authentic local inhabitants of Salamis, despite the currently prevailing views, but following the excellent analysis of Martha Taylor on the topic, cannot be proved that in the classical and Hellenistic period, that's to say in the Athenian period, there were not two categories of inhabitants in Salamis, one being formed of the Athenian clerics and identified by their demotic, the other one, descendants of the former inhabitants, would be second-class Athenian citizens. The fact that the Athenian settlers replaced the Garian settlers provides the best possible solution for the enigma also of the origin of the famous genos of the Salaminians. For those who are familiar with Athenian history, it's a big mystery with the genos of the Salaminians. The genos of the Salaminians, the religious association whose cults are linked to Salamis, but who were active in Athens in the classical and the beginning of the Hellenistic period. Since the publication of two crucial decrees of the Genos by William Scott Ferguson in 1938, there's been constant debate on the question of the origin of these Salaminians. Most scholars, like Ferguson himself, believe that the link with Salamis was a pure fiction. These Salaminians in Athens were a completely fiction, fictional link with Salamis. A minority of scholars think that, believe that uh, at the time of the Athenian takeover, there was a swap of population between uh, the Salaminians and the uh, Athenian clerics. It doesn't fit very well. If you want to, let's say, to have friendly relations with people, you expel them from their home. I think that the explanation I would suggest would be more economic. After being expelled by the Megarians, first in the seventh century, the Salaminians took refuge in Athens, where they were admitted into the citizen body, never to return to Salamis. However, they kept the memory of the origin, in city origin, the Kenos of Salaminians. The scenario explains well the difference between the Tetrapolis of Marathon, Eleusis, and Salamis. The first two territories were absorbed en bloc, and their inhabitants were incorporated into the citizen body. Salamis was a different case. It was a product of the common conquest of the Athenians. The new territory was void of its inhabitants, previous inhabitants. It was Athens as a state which was its owner, which implied for the new settlers to establish a status that could not be that of an ordinary property within the borders of the Athenian state. In the fifth century, the Athenians within the the framework of the empire, had the choice between two forms of legal status for their settlements in the territories they had conquered. The first one was autonomy and the loss of citizenship in Athens. The other one was clerical. We have good reason to believe that from the start, uh, Salamis was a clerical. An inscription of the end of the sixth century, IG 1Q1, provides us crucial information on the status of the clerics at Salamis. The control of Athens over Salamis materialized in the form of the settlements of Athenians who were probably defined as clerics. So we are very fortunate to have this inscription which defines the status of the clerics. It's the IG uh, in the series of the inscription of, uh, of Attica is the first uh, document. So the oldest we have, oldest public document 
on stone we have for, for, for Athens. So, um, the control of Athens over Salamis materialized in the form of the settlement of Athenians, who were probably defined as clerics. Although, unfortunately, you see the state of uh, the stone largely broken. There's a new fragment that should be added to, to the right. So, um, the, the word clericus, it's on your handout, um, but, well, here I just simplify. Uh, the word clericus has to be restored at the end of line one. But it is quite possible, in fact, uh, that it was uh, this is your handout number two, actually. Um, in fact, an inscription from Lemnos this time, and other clerici of the fourth century, one century later, refers to Ge, so the land, clerics, badly mutilated, but we have what we have, and refers to Salamis. So it's very. Uh, well, we suggest that there was uh, some connection between clerarchy and Salamis, and that Salamis was indeed uh, already a clerarchy in the at the turn of the sixth um, century. Uh, we'll come back to this text uh, later. So the state, the statute of Salamis, defines the conditions at which the clerics could dwell in the island. It established at least four series of regulations. This is well, broken, but the beginning we have, the first clause, line one three, provides the clerics would reside at Salamis under a proviso that they pay taxes at Athens and perform military service. Second clause uh, provides that the property of the clerics cannot be leased and that if it is, both the lesser and the lessee will be fine. The third clause provides details of the military duties of the clerics that you provide their own weapons. Although the text is mutilated, it provides us crucial information to make sense of the status of cleric. The first and third clause mention specific military duties and a specific military organization, although again, the detail is not fully clear. This suffices to link the status of cleric to military duties, a characteristic that uh, we meet again in other uh, uh, frameworks, for instance, in the Hellenistic kingdoms. The first clause also underscores the payment of taxes at Athens, which implies a lack of autonomy of the settlements and speaks in favor of a clerical rather than colonial status. For Salamis, we don't know the, we do not know the detail of the taxes that had to be paid, but for uh, the other islands of the, which are defined as, as clerics in the fourth century uh, BC, we have a famous law of 374, 373 BCE, and it establishes that the, the Athenians levied a dodecate, that is a tax in kind of 112 or 8.33%, on the grain produced in the islands of Imbros, Lemnos, and Skyros. Well, why is it uh, so important? In fact, Lemnos, above all, and Imbros produce a huge quantity of grain. The amount of uh, production of grain of these two small islands was the equivalent of the whole production of Attica. And so this, this tax in kind was of special significance for the Athenians. We do not know of any similar tax in kind levied in Attica itself. This was a specific tax levied on the clerics, which could be justified by the fact that these territories had been the common conquest of the Athenians, which in turn justified the payment. The clause on renting at Salamis is also uh, interesting insofar as it is echoed in documents relating to Athenian clerics. Um, this is in your handout number, number six, but you have it on the screen also. This is a regulation for the clerarchy at Lemnos. We have already seen this text. But there is also one line which is important for us. So there is no possibility to lease. This is exactly what we had also in, uh, in Salamis. 
with the exception of, just like also there was an exception in Salamis. So you see the, the two uh, texts should be studied in relation with uh, one uh, another. Um, enough with Athens. Let's move on. Still in the classical period. But let's go to uh, a kingdom this time. This, let's go to Macedon. Um, our first stop will be at Cassandreia in Chalkidiki in northern Greece. Cassandreia was a new city founded by Cassandras in 316 BCE. Cassandras ruled Macedon from 319 onwards. After the death of his father, he ruled Macedon until his own death in 298. Cassandreia, after his, well, which he founded, was located on the site of the former uh, the traditional Greek city of Potidaia. The region had been completely remodeled by the Macedonian conquest, the parallel with Salamis, if you like, um, completely remodeled by the Macedonian conquest. In 348 BCE, King Philip of Macedon famously destroyed Olynthus and the Chalcedon League. It's a crucial event in order to make sense of the text. We, we have at our disposal for the region and we, which refer to the statue of the land. An inscription coming from Cassandria that cannot predate 306 because it mentions Cassandros as a king and he, he proclaimed himself a king in 306 refers to donations made by this king. This is in your handout number seven, but you have most of it, the text here and the translation that follows. So, the text reads, Cassandras, king of the Macedonians, gave to Perdiccas, son of Koinos, the estate of the former in the firm, former territory of Sinos and the estate of Trapezus, both of which his grandfather, Polymocrates, received as Cleros, and also the estate which his father received as a Cleros in the time of Philip, on the same terms as those on which Philip gave them as a patrimonial possession, both they and their descendants having the full right to possess and exchange on and alienate them. Being the son of Koinos, a companion of Alexander, very famous companion of Alexander, fought uh, in, the, in the East, Perdiccas belonged to the elite of the elite of the Macedonians. The difficulty of the text, which has generated enormous discussion, is the apparent contradiction in terms between possession and gift. We see that originally two estates were given by Philip to Polymocrates, Perdiccas's grandfather. Inevitably, the gifts date back to between 348, date of the destruction of Olynthus, and 336, the date of the death of Philip II. A third estate was given to Koinos, Perdiccas's father, and again by Philip II, so before 336 again. It's easy to see that the estates passed from the grandfather to the son and then to the grandson, Perdiccas. But then, why was it necessary for Cassandras to seemingly give again these estates? There's a kind of paradox there. If uh, a land belongs to me, I don't ask you to give it again. That's the mystery of the estate. Even so, even more, if we uh, look to the end of the text, where this time it's an estate that Perdiccas himself has acquired that is given to him. And also the estate as Spartalus, which Perdiccas purchased for silver from Talimaios. Cassandros gives this also as a patrimonial possession so that he is a son of the full right to possess, etc., etc. So the controversy on the meaning of these donations has been lasting for more than a century. More recently, a form of consensus seems to have this established itself that Cassandros' donations were purely a product of circumstances. Thus, Miltiades at Zopolos suggests that the inscription on stone of Perdiccas' privileges and also the donations were only motivated by the transfer of the estate to the civic territory of Cassandria, and that Perdiccas had full and exclusive right on these estates. Interestingly, this solution had been rejected by Rostovtsev in 1910. More recently, in 2011, in a most uh, valuable article, Luciak Riscolo suggests that there must have been a casual reason like uh, conflicts between the family or 
dispute over ownership that would have motivated the reiteration of the donation. I believe, and with due respect to the extraordinary uh, scholars that are at Miltos Adopoulos and uh, Lucia Criscol, I think these solutions fail to convince me, at least. And the question of Cassandra's donation must be addressed, I think, in a global framework of the status of clerical land. In fact, there is no contradiction at all between the right of possession, including that of transferring the property and selling it, and the superior right of the king. The estates of Perdicast never left the king's land, the Cora Basilique. The Egyptian papyri relating to the status of the clerics bring full confirmation of this point. Before moving to Egypt, let us consider the case of Scythopolis, today Bet Shean, in northern Israel. Um, an inscription, which is uh, one of the jewels of the uh, Museum of Jerusalem, an inscription coming from the city offers a striking parallel with that of Cassandria. The excerpt I provide here is a memorandum uh, written by a certain uh, Ptolemaios, who was no less than a strategos and great priest for the region. This is your handout uh, number eight. Ptolemaios sent this memorandum to King Antiochus III, we are just after the crushing defeat of uh, the polemic defeat at Panion in 200 BCE, which allowed Antiochus III to take control of southern Syria. Ptolemaios was obviously one of these administrators who changed side and whose status and privileges were confirmed by Antiochus III. So uh, Ptolemaios asked the king to make sure that his privileges would be respected. I request, king, if you so please, to write to Cleon and Heliodorus, the famous Heliodorus, the joy Ketai, that as regards the villages which belong to me as freehold and patrimonial possession, and which you instructed to register to my name, no one should be permitted under any pretext to bill it himself, not to bring in others, nor to requisition property, nor to take away dependent peasants, the famous Laoi. Again, we find seemingly the same contradiction with villages that are enktesaikai in patrikois, is the way I translate as freehold and patrimonial possession, and the fact that the king had to confirm this donation by instructing to register them to Telemaios. Translation and interpretation of this passage has been the object of many debates, again. Most scholars have considered there were, in fact, three categories of estates. Those that were in Tessay, those that were in, in, in Patrikos, and finally the village, villages that were ascribed by the king. Luchak Rizkolo has shown recently that the villages in Tessay and those in Patrikos form actually one and single, the same category. But to my opinion, one should go even one step further and consider there are not two categories, and they say in Patrikos, and those that were assigned by uh, the king. But one only, uh, we have only one series of villages, and that what's, what's was about that uh, uh, the king has confirmed the possession of these estates, or villages in this case, that were uh, in Tessai and Patrikos, and they were uh, he instructed to register them. Of course, when there was the, the takeover by Antiochus III, this had to be done because he was the new king in the land. Um, so once again, the estate never left the king's land. It was simply a transfer from the Ptolemies to the Seleucid. The superior property of the king is not at stake. Finally, we will end our journey in Egypt. The documents from Ptolemaic Egypt, studied by Dorothy Thompson to Manning, and very recently in the great book of Christelle fischer Bobet, uh, Army and Society in Ptolemaic Egypt, proved that a series of specific rules applied to clerical clan. The cleric owed military services and a certain number of specific taxes. If he died without a son, the clerus came back to the Basilicon, the royal treasury. This is what we see in a famous papyrus of 238, BCE, this is in your handout number nine. So read. Um, the cavalrymen listed below have died. Um, therefore, 
uh, take uh, their clairoy for the royal treasury. At Bubastis, at the core of Epimenes, Sitalkes, son of so-and-so, captain. At Theogenes, of the core of Lacon, Makos, son of captain, etc. There's a list of those people who have died, and uh, the, the state has to take care of their clairoy. Uh, another papyr papyrus, papyrus Lille 1-4 of 217 BC, it's indeed made clear that if the cleric dies without a son, it is when the cleric dies without a son that the clerics will come back to the royal treasury. Otherwise, we can suppose it is directly inherited by the, the son. This proves once and for all, to my opinion, that if the cleric possessed the land, he was never the superior owner, at least in this period in Egypt. The text of Cassandria and other early Macedonian texts, Scythopolis and Ptolemaic Egypt, present the same legal structure. Thus, at Cassandria, we should not invoke a special ad hoc reason to make sense of the new donation of Cassandros. The very nature of Claros given in Patricos, uh, Patricos to Perdicas' grandfather and father is sufficient reason to make sense of the new donation by Cassandros. There is, however, a difference that remains difficult to justify, apparently, between the donation of Cassandros and the attribution of Clara in the Ptolemaic kingdom. For the Ptolemaic clerics, the control and possible reattribution took place at the death of the cleric, which is not the case at Cassandra. Uh, how can we make sense of this difference? Of course, a legal conflict on the ownership is always possible. I don't deny that. But perhaps it is a better hypothesis to make sense of the specific timing of the donation. Between 310, date of the death of Alexander IV, assassinated by Cassandra himself, and 306, there was no more king in Macedon. It's only in 306 when Cassandros takes a royal title, like the other diadochi, that the constitutional gap is filled. I think that might well justify the donation by Cassandros, who as new king, solemnly confirmed, and after the again constitutional gap, confirmed the donations of his predecessors. We find this, so this is why it's exceptional in some way. But we find the same situation as Kitopolis with a new king, this time by conquest, Antiochus III confirms the donation of the Ptolemies to Ptolemaeus. Therefore, the information brought forward by the Cassandra dossier is crucial. To my opinion, it proves that already in the second half of the fourth century, and if, even before Alexander's conquest of Asia, the status of cleric was well defined in Macedon. On this point, like on so many others, it is thus clear that the cleric system came to Asia with the Macedonian conquerors. Others argued, and this would be my conclusion, that the legal status known as clerochia is linked to a specific situation when a state, a city, or a king, while remaining the owner of a land, allocates land, uh, lots of this land to settlers who, in exchange of the rights to hereditary possession, including the right to sell it, owe uh, specific duties, first of all military service, but also specific taxes and other duties. Beyond this common framework, the cleric contracts, if I dare say, differed from one another. And there is no reason to believe that in the detail uh, the rules that applied to the Athenian clerics were necessarily the same as those that applied to clerics in the Macedonian tradition, in Macedon or in the Hellenistic kingdoms. An Athenian cleric could not lease his land. But on this point, I, I don't know simply. It remains to be proved that the same rule applied to Macedonian clerics. Only the son of the Ptolemaic cleric could inherit his father's clerics, at least in the third century in Egypt. But it remains to be proved that the same rule applied in the Athenian clerics. I think for the time being, we just don't know. Finally, we should come back to the question asked at the beginning of this lecture whether negative externalities that uh, impacted the cleric's possession of the land, and it would have been a uh, disincentive uh, to invest his time and activity in the cleric. I suppose that this is our cleric. What do they think of his clerics? We have good reason to answer in the negative, and first of all, because of the transferability of the clerics, if the donation was made in patrimony. This was a, 
a strong incentive for him to take uh, the Claris seriously, right? You can transfer that to your son or descendants, uh, etc. But with some caveats, however. The great Macedonian noblemen who received donations at the beginning of uh, the third century BC in uh, Macedon or in Asia Minor. They received donations from the Hellenistic kings, do their best to transfer the estates to the territory of a city. This is a clue that the status of civic land remained more attractive, more favorable than that of the clerochia or other status in the king's land. The reason was certainly that taxes, I suspect, were higher in the Cora Basilicae when there was status of cleric. In Egypt in the second century BCE, several papyri show that the obstacles to the transferability of the claris to a daughter seem to disappear. There are people who know much better than I do the, uh, the Egyptian uh, dossier, but that's this descent. And other evolutions, like exemption of specific taxes, are also reckoned in Egypt. In the long durée, the trend was just to a standardization of property rights. I meant my best to transform stitch rags into a cloak. Whether I've succeeded is not up to me to say. Thank you for your attention.